that you actually have brain tissue in your lower spine where the information comes from your foot, goes to the lower spine, and goes back down to the foot. It never even goes to your brain. So, I mean, it's, it's massive. So without the vestibular system, this woman's able to balance. So, Hello and welcome to the Weight Free Wellness Podcast. I'm Tara Bachland, the founder of the Weight Free Wellness Podcast and platform. And my guest today is Jim Klopman. He is the author of Balance is Power and also the creator of the Balance Bow and Balance Block Systems. And today we're talking about balance. So... Balance is not just for the athlete, although if you are an athlete, if you're an everyday person, if you simply want to slow aging and make sure that you're not ending up in the nursing home before it's time, definitely listen to this podcast because training balance really literally is for everybody these days. And it can help you from athletic performance to even mental capability. It's really fascinating how this is really the next step, the next stage in health and wellness is neuroplasticity. So check this out. Here you go. Enjoy. Looking forward to it. Well, Jim, thank you so much for joining us today. I really look forward to talking about this subject. I'm proud to be here. I really appreciate you having me on. Thank you. You bet. Well, this topic, um, you know, I didn't really know how much I would be interested in it because I had been very athletically involved for most of my adult life because basically for the reason, because as a kid, I was tremendously uncoordinated and some part of me just wanted to overcome that. So I think I found a new area to work on. I'm excited for this. So you created um, this Slack bow system, a Slack block. And why don't you just give us a, a little insight into what exactly that is? Well, I developed a, it's funny just to comment on your uncoordinated aspect of your life. We found that, you know, coordination and balance equal each other. So we've had a lot of people come and go, oh, I'm uncoordinated. And when they balance, when they improve their balance, they are become more coordinated. I got started in this, you know, I must have gotten started in it when I was in a, a child because I had a lot of brain damage. I think that occurred when I was a child. I've always been balance challenging myself. So my most comfortable point in life is when I'm flying down a ski hill at 60 miles an hour, riding a motorcycle at speeds I shouldn't ride at or driving a car. Any of these things that are massive neural inputs seem to quiet my mind down. <clears throat> and then when I was 50, I uh, when skiing with the famous Stein Erickson, he was 74, and I had been skiing since I was three, and I just always aspired to ski well in my 70s, 80s, and 90s. But I saw a lot of people drop out of skiing for no good reason, and then I started thinking about other sports. You know, why would a golfer get worse when he gets older, like 40 years old? He, he's, you don't need a lot of strength in golf, and the skill should get better the more you do them. So I figured it wasn't fitness because we're also, I'm fitter today probably than I was when I was 30 years old and I'm 64. Um, And it couldn't be skill because the more you do something, the better you're supposed to get. So I was trying to figure out what the secret was and I thought maybe it was balance. So I looked into the industry for some balance training and there wasn't really anything good out there. And I started developing my own methods and systems looking at how humans move and trying to replicate that in a balance type situation. Well, lo and behold, my skiing got better. I was kind of surprised, considerably better. And then I started, I wasn't even, I'm not into the fitness world. I don't make equipment. I did this all for myself. So I exposed it to other athletes and they were having remarkable results. And um, it's just, it's remarkable. The human balance system is one of the least understood systems that we have. There's 40,000 neuroscientists in the world and about 20,000 of them are trying to understand this brain body interaction. And they're still learning. It's, it's, You know, people go, oh, it's vestibular, it's proprioceptive. It's everything. It's such a huge neural system, and it's what makes us human. We're the only mammal that stands on a, you know, bipod system all day long. And at that, we spend most of our time on one foot, not both feet at the same time. And given that you're standing up at your stand-up desk and all that (laughs) practicing what you preach. Right, exactly. And so you've written a book also, which I've just finished, um, Balance is Power, And so describing your system and background and so forth. And there are a lot of key points in here that I find really interesting and that I like to get into also. So it sounds like this stemmed as an experiment to see how you could improve um, in your performance. on the Right. Right. It did, but it ended up being much bigger than that. Um, You know, besides the improvement with athletes, I, uh, 
some in my when I was 47, I just I bought a book on ADD because uh, my wife at the time's brother supposedly had ADD, and I started reading the book. And I think it was driven to distraction. It has a list of 25 symptoms, and if you have six of them, you have ADD. So I started reading the book, going, "Oh, this looks like me." And so I handed it to my wife, and I said, "How many of these 25 do I have?" And she looked at it, threw it back to me, and said, "You have all 25." Mm -hmm. So then I said. Well, that's, she's crazy. So I went to see one of the foremost specialists in ADD in the country. And he said, I'll take five sessions and we've got to do this. We've got to do that. And you don't have it. You look like you don't have it, all this stuff. And I think we were halfway through the second session. And honest to God, he said, you poor bastard, you have the worst case of ADD I've ever seen. Oh. And so things just started to clarify for me. You know, I flunked every spelling test I ever took. I flunked eighth grade two years in a row. Like my dad said, how could you flunk religion two years in a row? How stupid can you be? Uh, and then I flunked ninth grade. And then it took me, I kept trying. I'd flunk out of college, go get a job, go back, try college again, flunk out. And then age 58, I think I went to see Daniel Amen, the famous brain doctor who was on you know, public television and written all those books. And they did a brain scan and I had pretty extensive brain damage. And so they explained to me I had the brain of an NFL football player and that I was going to head towards dementia and chronic traumatic encephalopathy or Alzheimer's. <clears throat> and I just wasn't going to do that. So it started to dawn on me that maybe this balance training has something to do with it because they said to me, they said, there's, you have a massive amount of damage to your cerebellum and we believe in neuroplasticity and the brain's able to rewire itself. So what you need to do is you need to balance train because that's where the balance system's in the cerebellum. And I said, but that's what I do every day. And they go, no, you need to do more. And I'm like, no, no human being could do more than I do because I train people every day. To do this. this is all I do is balance. And they're like, well, you need to do more. They couldn't even grasp what I was talking about. So at that point, I started going, hmm, maybe there's a massive relationship between the balance training and my brain. And then since then, We've worked with several, I'm working with one now, uh, I can't call them patients because I'm not a medical person, but they're clients who have uh, non-recovering or, or, or post-concussive syndrome. They have symptoms that they can't get rid of. And one of them was a, a physical therapist. So her own medical group team, so to speak, club couldn't help her. She had nine concussions over 10 years and she couldn't, she couldn't drive, ride a bike, read, do anything. And we worked with her, and after one session, her eyes lit up, color came back to her face. And, you know, we put her back together after 13 sessions of balance training. That's a different protocol than what we do with the athletes. But we're having massive results with people who come in and have these symptoms that are not recovering from. The woman I'm seeing now has seen several physical therapists, doctors. She's already been through three sessions. She said she hasn't felt as good in two years. And this isn't something that's not based on science. There's great research coming out of um, University of Wisconsin, Paul Bakarita, the famous doctor who discovered neuroplasticity, invented this device called a portable neurostimulator where they put a stimulator on the tongue and they stimulate the tongue and people who have no balance suddenly go, boom, they're standing within 20 seconds. And then when they take the stimulator out, they continue to balance for a while and then it falls off. And that, that sort of post period becomes longer and longer and longer. And what's great is none of the researchers at the University of Wisconsin understand it, other than they're stimulating one of the most nerve-rich parts of the body, which is the tongue. When we do balance training, we're stimulating every nerve. It's, we, we stimulate the whole nervous system. And I think that's why we have success with these concussion patients. So there's so much tied into what you just said. There are so many aspects. And I think if I had not read the book, I wouldn't be able to piece them apart. And I'm really <laughs> glad that I did. Um, because there, I appreciate you reading the book. I really Absolutely. do. Absolutely. It was um, very insightful. And so one of the things to, to go back um, a moment is that, so you were already doing balance training just to improve your own performance, but right. on this quest, um, you had known somehow that there was, you know, the ADHD, I think right. you mentioned dyslexia in your bio. Right. Yeah. Um, so you already knew that there, was, there were these conditions. And then, so your exam with Dr. Amen had confirmed that this brain damage was right. in the area specifically for um, balance. So right. did, did your, um, did the development of Slack flow, black bow and the slack block develop because you decided or found out you had to enhance your training even more? No, it didn't. It actually did. I did it for athletic performance. So, you know, and, and but let's, 
you know, like everything's intertwined. Yeah. I wanted to keep skiing well into my seven. I did not want to go a little pokey pokey down the hill. I wanted to go fast. I wanted to go hard. Because I knew when I went fast and hard skiing, I felt great. My brain felt great. Everything was wonderful at the end of the day for several hours. Uh, while I'm out there, there's no chitter chatter going on in my head. It's just, yeah. and I want to be able to keep doing that. So I knew that that was my massive comfort zone. Mm -hmm. And if I couldn't get to that comfort zone, life was going to suck. So that's why I wanted to improve my balance. Well, it turns out that, you know, when I'm in my late 50s, I finally decided after you know, 40 years of unsuccessful therapy. And I sat on the board for 10 years as, a, as an advisor to the Association for Comprehensive Energy Psychology. You know, I selected a couple of the presidents, the executive director, I was their internal advisors. Here I am advising all these professional psychologists and none of them could help me. <laughs> the best of the best. And I had these problems. And finally, I did, I guess, what our parents always tell us to do. You need to get your head examined. So I went and got my head examined. And it turns out, there was something going on. And it turns out that intuitively I know I needed to do this balance training. And there's great research to support what I'm saying that, you know, that they believe that a walk in nature is as effective as, as um, you know, an antidepressant, so to speak, as opposed to a walk in an urban landscape. Because a walk in nature is a balance challenge. A walk in an urban landscape is not a balance challenge. Right. Well, speaking of the science aspects, so there are a couple things that um, you mentioned in particular, talking about the, and even referring to your case um, a, a bit, I think, is that um, if a person has brain damage in a certain area, or even, for example, loses function, let's say they're hearing, or right. I'm sorry, they're balanced because the, the, the function inside the ear is no longer right. working. That's where the, the training in Wisconsin or the scientists were using those devices on the right. top because they were right. training another right. part of the brain right. to do the job of balance, which is fascinating. Yeah, and, and, they, and they don't even know because here's the thing. They had, they had one woman, I've had several women named Cheryl Switz came in. She, so they say the balance organs, the vestibular system, which are these three channels inside the brain that have fluid that kind of turn around over these little hairs and it kind of tells you where you are in space. She had a virtually destroyed vestibular system. So her main balance organ, the vestibular system, was destroyed. She puts this neurostimulator on her tongue, and she can stand up and balance. And they, they're like, well, how do you do that without a balance system? This is what I've always said is, number one, we don't really know much about the balance system. I can always call it magic. But I also know it's a hugely multimodal system. It's the vestibular system in the ear. It's your muscles and where you are in space. You have a map for every position your body can be in. It's a mapping system. The bottom of your feet have 100,000 to 200,000 nerve endings to tell you where you are, unless you're on crappy, mushy shoes. And I guess we're going to talk about the shoes later. Um, you know, you, even we see people hold their hands a certain way, and we teach people how to use their hands and sense energies through their hands. I know that sounds crazy. We see everybody hold their tongue in a certain position, and we teach them how to hold their tongue because we think the tongue somehow is involved. So this system is mad, and they've just discovered it. Um, oh, God, I forget the name of the university. It'll come to me in a minute. That you actually have brain tissue in your lower spine where the information comes from your foot, goes to the lower spine, and goes back down to the foot. and never even goes to your brain. So, I mean, it's, it's massive. So, without the vestibular system, this woman's able to balance. So, I, I can't comment one way or the other to know why something works or not works. And nobody else knows either. Mm -hmm. But we know we, you can see certain results. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And one thing I remember you wrote about, too, and kind of had a personal testimonial there is that uh, people generally feel good when they get, get off of the device or get done with training. Right. It's a, listen, you know, nobody ever said we need to spend more time in the office. Nobody. I don't care who you are. We need to get out of the office. We need to go out of the office. We need to clear our heads. Go out, oh, we need to go on a retreat because we perform better on a retreat. All these things are based on a balance challenge. You walk into the office, everything's rectilinear. You have perfectly vertical walls, perfectly flat floors, things you never see in nature. You go out in nature, everything's uneven and fractal. There's no straight lines anywhere in any visual field. There's only a couple of minerals in the world that are truly flat and, you know, horizontal and vertical, but they're way below the earth and we don't see them. So we go out and we have our balance stimulated. We ride motorcycles, we ski, we go to amusement parks, we play golf, we play tennis, we do all of the yoga, martial arts. I mean, 
what's your objective? And I know you're a martial artist. What's the objective really in martial arts when you're fighting with somebody is to knock the other guy off balance. It's all a game of balance. So when you challenge your balance, your brain sort of lights back up, things get good. You do this Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and then you go back to work and have it screwed up all week again because you're looking at screens and you're in a perfectly flat floor, vertical wall area. So to me, it's a, it's, it's, we do it because ride horses. I mean, I just you can go on and on and on. What balance challenges do they make you feel better? And it's a business problem for us because most people feel like and we have, you know, world class athletes come out of there going, well, I don't feel like I got much for a workout. And then they'll call me the next day and go, oh, I went to my spinning class and I couldn't finish my spinning class. They walk out of the gym feeling good because when you walk out of a gym, out of our gym feeling good. When you walk out of a normal gym, you're doing what we call single plane motion. It's called um, bilateral movements that are never seen in sport. Everything in sports, ipsy lateral, crossing the body, one side of the body, the other. And they walk out from lifting weights and doing all that stuff, and, they, and you hear them say, oh, my, my trainer beat the crap out of me today. I feel like crap. And that's supposed to be something that makes you feel good. Mm -hmm. I don't think it does. Our people walk out and go, wow. I feel great. My brain feels great. I think I'd go back to work, blah, blah, blah. But the body's depleted. They just don't know it is. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, bilateral movement you're talking about that really struck home when I was reading about that. One of, so my, my husband is my martial arts uh, trainer. Primarily. Right. I was going to say guru, but that probably weirds some people yeah, out. Right. <laughs> but he really is. He's pretty awesome. Um, right. so we've trained for over 15 years and right. initially say, the the people that were the hardest to train were the people who just lifted weights all the time. Yes. Their body right. was just used to moving right. in these certain planes of motion right. Right. across hemispheres. And so right, on. right. And it's kind of very interesting, too. You, you talk about the ipsilateral movement. So, right. like, the person takes a step. Usually, it's the opposite arm that moves with the right. opposite right. forward. And right. likewise, backwards. Right. And you also said that that's a symptom, too, when someone has right. concussion. Right. It, so it's uncoordination, it's concussion symptom. Right, right. Okay. You know, it's interesting you picked up on that because most people don't. Anyway, so um, it's a symptom people have concussions and in chronic conditions. We've trained people who have MS, um, and it's the same sort of thing. And, and I'll give you a fascinating story on it that matches up with your martial arts in just a second. But the, the, for some reason, when people – get some sort of chronic thing. You see it oftentimes in people who have severe autoimmune diseases. It moves, the right leg moves with the right hand. And that's just not something we were meant to do. First of all, and we work with, you know, cross body motions, the right side of the brain is supposed to control the left side of the body. And we'll actually have people get stuck into that, that single movement pattern. And we'll take them through a series of ipsilateral movements. And then suddenly they can balance better. Now, this is, I think, one of the most exciting things I've heard in years in terms of movement therapy. Some trainer took his uh, group of elderly uh, uh, patients or uh, clients from an old folks home that had Parkinson's disease, and he took them to a boxing gym and in a wheelchair or barely stand up. These are people that can't talk, and they just punch the bag. And within weeks, people who haven't talked for years are talking. People who can't walk are walking. And everybody's trying to figure out. Well, now the researchers are trying to study this, figure this whole thing out. And it's this crossing motion. It's just crossing. Now, when you cross, if I punch across the body, my hips have to rotate. My weight shifts. I go to the inside of the left foot and the inside of the right foot. I have to have my knees slightly pronated. You can't screw this motion up. And they do that, and it's virtually curing these people. And so, I mean, I, to me, that, that ipsilateral movement is what makes it. And we do a, a muscle test, we call it. We, it's, um, I think they call it the spleen meridian in, in, in Chinese medicine. But we'll have people do this bilateral movement, just faking five-pound weights. You're and then like we go, lifting your arms above your head yeah. for people who can't see. Yeah, so I'm, I'm just doing a, what do you call it, arm press with dumbbells on either arm. Or you can use a barbell. It doesn't matter. Um, and then we test the, the strength of the shoulder. It's weak. They can't hold it at all. And you can be a 300-pound lineman. It's weak. And then we go, okay, now do a series of ipsilateral movements across the body. 
you be a 90 pound woman locks up, you can't pull it away. And this is not an act of strength. This is an act of, and I've talked to orthopedic doctors about this. This is an act of like six or seven muscles in the shoulder have to coordinate into a locking position. If they can't, and the word is coordinate, if they can't coordinate, they can't do it. Well, this is a decoordinating movement all of these movements when you move in that single plane and bilateral type of movement. And so we have actually, another thing that happens too is when you get into that single plane work, you're working big muscles. So when you do balance training, we're moving every little tiny muscle in your body, they're all little micro muscles and they don't even know what they really are in science yet. But we'll see beautiful bodies come in and they get up and start doing some more balance training and all they can do is flap their hands because it's the only thing that's left that hasn't been locked up with big muscles. Mm. So they'll have their hands, you know, these big muscular guys. Why are my hands doing this? Well, the whole body wants to move freely. The arms want to move all around the body. They can't do it because they're locked down in big muscles and that's all they got left. So it's, it's fascinating. And, and of course, I've been saying this for five years and you know, we say we build better muscles, not bigger muscles, and people still look at me like I'm crazy. So one day. <laughs> yeah, we're still moving out of that realm, I think. You know, yeah. I definitely am a part of that realm, too, where, you know, it's not necessarily how you look, but how you can perform. It, and you, I've seen, I mean, the dance class I'm a part of, I'm the youngest person in the class. There are three people 70 and above. Wow, and isn't that great? be amazed by how well right. they can move. And you'd see them right. on and you might not be able to notice or the average person or sure would be. I see it yeah but but those who are trained and work with people right. in that right. realm can definitely spot by their posture and right. their feet and so many right. things right that, exactly. that's why I want to emphasize with the weight free wellness podcast too that it's not all about weight they're do, they're much better indicators of health than just seeing what the the scale is saying what do you think that gripes me and this is going to anger you know maybe not a lot of people in your audience but the, the whole paleo paleo you know conferences going on now and this is paleo and that's paleo well, we have no idea what paleo is because all we have is skeletons from the paleolithic era but what we do have and i'm old enough to remember this um is all through the last century national geographic they were discovering ind indigenous tribes all over the world that had never been exposed to modern man and even today you can still see photos of some of these indigenous tribes that really have no exposure to modern man None of them look like they're ripped. They have stomach muscles like I've got. They've got a long stomach muscle. There's no separation of the individual muscles. It's one long muscle. It's protruded out. The, uh, the chest is not, it's strong, but it's not this big, massive thing. There's not huge biceps or long biceps. The feet are spread out like this. So that's truly the closest thing to paleo are these indigenous tribes. And they don't look anything like these guys that, you know, we see doing all this work with weights nowadays. I mean, really, and I, don't get me wrong, I'm, I've had a great con uh, podcast recently with some guys. Uh, it's called Beyond the Barbell. Um, and I'm trying to remember the, uh, Blair and, anyway, Blair and Ben. But they're, they're wonderful guys and, you know, really opened everything. But what they do in CrossFit's amazing and the bodies they build are amazing, but they're really for warriors, current daily to today's warriors. A warrior today doesn't fight. He has to carry his equipment, bullets, and things to live with for several days in very rough terrain and then shoot people with a gun from a certain distance. So really he's more of a pack horse than he is a athlete. And so they build really, really great pack horses that have to go over very difficult terrain. I think it's wonderful and I think it's amazing what they do, but it's not necessarily makes you the most athletic person in the world. Right. Yeah. And it's all what you want to be able to do with your body now and particularly in the future. Oh. <laughs> you can maintain that functionality. Yeah. The so numbers are amazing. Yeah. Really important, which is um, the bilateral movement or yeah, cross hemisphere. Right. And one of the arts that martial arts that I train is called Kali, and there's a, a pretty popular uh, YouTube. Not yeah, it's on YouTube, but it's a TED Talk by mm -hmm. his name is Paul McCartney, and he's also a Kali instructor. And they did a really wonderful video and describing the neuroplasticity that is enhanced by doing this bilateral movement. Oh sure, yeah. Kali involves using two sticks that are. Um, about two and a half to three feet long and depending on your own size and right. uh, and it is tremendous bilateral movement uh, 
training because you're right. using two sticks and then you're also training your feet bilaterally and right. then in combination. Right. And so what I was wondering is I was conceptually thinking about the, the, the slack block and the slack bow is that you're doing these micro movements across center when you're balancing. And I wonder if that's a part of well, you know, the interesting thing is we don't do any, we, we try to keep the instruction level to zero. You know, I know, um, but you still get positional work. But, you know, typically everything you do as an athlete, you're on one foot or the other. The only sports you really have both feet on the ground, equally weighted is going to be lifting weights or something like that. So even when I'm on one foot, there's a bilateral sense. First of all, we try to get all the weight on the inside front quadrant of the foot. The big toe is a big toe for a reason. You know, half the bones and muscles in your body, I mean, a quarter of all the bones and muscles in your body are in your feet. Well, and most of those muscles are in the inside front quadrant of your feet. They're not in your heels and they're not on that outside surface of the foot. So once you learn to pronate your foot just a little bit and you have your knee inside your toe, then your hip has to switch to that you know, switch out a little bit, and then you are in a bilateral movement. You pretty much will have your left shoulder over your right leg when you're balancing. And so that in itself is an ipsilateral movement. And then when you watch somebody move and they get to free up their upper body, the more you can free up your body, the better your balance will be. Like a great ballet dancer doesn't look like she's doing much, right? There's no forced move. Everything just kind of flows. Well, that's the body moving as it should. And over time, as the body learns how to balance, and by the way, Balance, improving your balance is not a muscle skill. So we're not teaching you to do something new like hitting a golf ball. And it's not building a muscle. So it's not like lifting weights. It is a software system. Mm -hmm. It is remarkable. From the day we start training you to improve your balance, your world changes. You get better at balance between the end of session one and beginning of session two. The brain starts to go, I got this. I got to put this back in this in a play again. And the improvements are remarkable. And the improvements in athletes are remarkable. I mean, I've had skiers come, I've had one skier come back to me after two sessions and he, he accused me of hypnotizing him because he improved so much in, in, in two days. Um, so it, it's that kind of thing. But, you know, going back to my point about the ipsilateral movement and the small muscles, when you learn how to use, when you learn how to balance, one thing that happens is your kinetic chain gets better. So golfers look smoother when they hit the golf ball. You run smoother, you cut smoother, everything kind of flows better because it's the ultimate control system. And when you're trying to overcome the balance system, you're trying to run faster in your balance system, you can't. You can't cut faster in your balance system. So the best athletes are the most graceful, the most ballet-like, and they absolutely have the best balance. Yeah, it's so interesting because ballet I use as my barometer, like my ballet class is a barometer. Oh, yeah how my brain is doing. And if oh. I'm just too distracted or, or just really right. thinking about a project, it's really difficult to balance, even though I'm really focusing. And on a day that I'm so on, I don't even hardly have to think about it. And I'm just more present. And Right. We actually have a, a – because we get clients in like that. And, you know, like I said before, ballet is – you can achieve some of the same objectives that we achieve just by taking ballet. You know, my joke is, and you corrected me earlier, you don't need one, but, you know – at least in my place, you don't need a tutu and a funny pair of shoes, but I know you don't need a tutu. But anyways, um, you know, the, we purposely don't play music in our studio because it artificially shuts off the conscious mind. Mm -hmm. We also push people in terms of we teach them how to use their vision to open up their vision. We teach them how to activate all their senses. And when you learn how to use your open vision, when you learn how to activate all your senses and try it sometimes, have great peripheral vision. Feel your skin, feel the hair on your body, feel the air against your body, feel your fingertips, feel whatever the taste is in your mouth, the sound you're hearing, the smells you smell. Activate all the senses and tell me you're not mindful. You have zero in place. And what we have is something we call a five-minute neural reset. And we'll have people come in and I'll go, what the hell's wrong with you? And go, oh, did you watch the news this morning? <laughs> oh, I just got off the phone, had a bad business phone call. And we take people through this five-minute neural reset. And I mean, I've had, you know, very left brain people just go to me. That's insane. I don't get that. Why did that work? But it's just setting up those firing patterns. And once you reset those firing patterns, it clears the mind. And now you can go do your ballet or you can play any sport. 
I, I'd love it if you had, is that something you could do on your own? Like if you had an instructional video? Yeah, we, I mean, I share that. We don't share it with many people, but we just, right now we're keeping things under wraps because this whole industry is locked up with, hey, let me show you the cool stuff I do all over Instagram before you know it, boom, it's gone. And, you know, I developed 90% of this, so I'm not willing to, you know, I'll share it with you, but I'm just not willing to give it away because, you know, we have a protocol for golf. I've trained four golfers. Two of them in the late 60s, lifelong golfers, shot the lower scores of their life. Another golfer who's 60, never had a handicap below like five. After four hours of training, he's a three handicap. So now I'm like, well, yeah, I could go and brag about all these things online, but I'm not going to. I mean, that's, to somebody that's got to be worth a lot of money at some point in time. So if I disseminate the information, I like to do it in a more organized way rather than an ego-satisfying way of putting it all over the Internet. <laughs> Oh, yeah, definitely. Just wondering if there might be a video to even pay and watch someday, if that's something you need to yeah, we will through, or, or if you could do it on your own if you had the instruction. Yeah, it's easy to do on your own. And so we, and that's the thing, we're trying to, honestly, I think I suck at monetizing things, but, you know, I, I you know, where do I go with this? I originally thought there ought to be 500 balance training gyms all over the country because we train, you know, from kids 12 years old with concussions to 70 year olds that are kind of losing it. But, and we don't ever touch those who are in need of physical therapy. That's, mm -hmm. you know, a few steps beyond that. Um, so we're just trying to, you know, I got products. We got a whole pipeline of products we're sitting on now, just trying to figure out a way to release this information in a proper way. And I don't keep it so locked up that, like I said, I will send you a video on that neural reset and uh, try it and see how you do when you go to ballet afterwards. Cool. I'd love to. And definitely put out a testimonial out there for it. So that leads into a good summary as far as you know, there's really different types of people that you work with. Anyone right. that... The athlete, um, you have had people either I don't directly come in. Um, even one of your clients was um, uh, a man who brought in his wife who had MS yeah. and uh, apparently made some significant improvements. Um, yeah. There's also some long longevity and just age and safety right. training. Right. So right. Um, maybe let's start with the, la the what I mentioned for or last, the safety aspect and, and longevity, how um, just doing a simple training like this can – can just keep keep you safe yeah it's you know it's it's mine i mean i have lots of friends and you know cool kids are like in the biohacking community and the i mean, it just drives me crazy they walk around you know one of the most famous ones of all i won't even name him but you know he wants to live to be 180 he very well may but he's going to be in a wheelchair because he's very unathletic he's you know losing men lose their ass because they stand up too upright and they put too much weight on their back um so, you know, it's just confusing to me. And then when you look at the numbers, the numbers are insane. It's the number one cause of accidental death and accidental injury for people over the age of 65. It's the number one cause of concussions. You know, people go, oh, concussion. They think it's all sports. No, it's falls is the number one cause of concussions. Mm -hmm. It falls is the number one cause of industrial deaths. If you're over the age of 45 and you go to the emergency room, it's the number one reason you go to emergency room. Half of all visits to emergency room over the age of 45 are for falls. Imagine what we could do if we could fix the problem, what our medical costs, because you know, our biggest medical costs are in the emergency room, would go down. But here's the craziest thing. So if you look at cancer over the last 20 years, it's gone down like 20%. You look at I mean, death from heart rates, it's gone down like, I mean, heart attacks has gone down by 20%. You look at deaths from falls over the last 15 years, it is nearly doubled so you have fitter people and this is not this is this is population adjusted so it's not like there's more older people going in the population it's a per 100,000 number you have fitter people you have safer spaces my god if you have a little sidewalk bump you know they're out there shaving it off because you god forbid you'll trip on that and fall safer spaces better health care better fitness and yet that death rate's going up. That doesn't, it makes sense to me. I know why, but it doesn't make sense to me why we don't get more attention to it. Now, the uh, NIH has funded a study for $30 million where they want to fix the problem, but they're going to address it like this. They're going to study people age 75 who have bad balance. Well, that's like saying, well, let's, let me work with people who've been smoking their whole life and have lung cancer and see what we can do to help them out. It's too late. You got to get in the game earlier than that. So it's a very, very important thing to do. And I think, you know, 
you're a pretty young woman. You see, you know, you see people that want to stay young their whole life. They don't think that movement has anything to do with it. Well, if you move like an old person, you look like an old person. If you move like a young person, you look like a young person. Well, in the book, too, you directly talked about you know, your walking pace is equal right. to, your, to your, how you're aging. Right, exactly. And There's similar a, to the, you know, Joseph Pilates said, you know, the health of your back is right. equivalent to your... Right, he's right. Yeah. Yeah. He's right. And, you know, we see people walking, you know, we talked earlier about shoes, but we see, you know, the shoes, there's not a cool kid, intelligent person from Silicon Valley to any of these high tech areas, any place in the world that can explain to me why you wear a heel on a shoe. There's well, no you, reason. You gave an interesting explanation in the book about hypothesis, at least. Right. That you thought. There's two hypotheses. One is because horses, you needed it to hold the syrup up, and then people wore heels because they would think, you know, walking down the street, you were cool that you had a horse because you had heels on your shoes. But the other is they say the French kings wanted to be, t- which I love, it was the men, the French kings wanted to be taller and wore high heels. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't, it's cute to see a woman with nice legs wearing high heels and you know, you go out to dinner or something like that. That looks great. I'm okay with that. I'm a guy, so I'm not totally out of tune with life. Hang on to her. Just hang, What's that? Just hang on to her. Right. But, <laughs> you know, but, you know, from a day-to-day movement thing and going to work every day, it's crazy. But <clears throat> the point is you see people coming in with massive heel strikes. And I see this with men. They come in with massive heel strikes. It's sending a, you know, twice your body weight shock all the way up to every joint in your body. And they've got their... They think posture is standing up with their ass rolled forward, or that I think it's called an, an anterior tilt. And, you know, it's rolled under. Well, they're rolling it under, they're disengaging their butt, and they're making their butt smaller, putting all the pressure on their spine, and their hamstrings are getting smaller. And then they have bad backs, and they can't, they can't understand why. Mm-hmm. If you want to be an athlete, you should walk on the forward part of your feet with no heels on your shoes and be an athlete every time you move. And when you see really good athletes, and you were talking before about ballet dancers, I can see a good athlete. I can see a good dancer. I can just tell you by the way they move that mm-hmm. they're an athlete every waking hour, not just the hours that they're in the gym. And a big aspect of weight-free wellness is, is to inspire. You know, you don't have to be an athlete, although it can be fun just to be to perform right. better, to right. at least not to degrade, to have a degrading body. Right. Right. And to feel that, so a great testimonial from our dance class. So there's this one lady, we have all it. So I live in Minnesota. I believe you're in Utah, right? Yes. So you get snow and stuff to get more with your skier. So uh, in our dance class, we, every one of us has a story of when we were going to take a spill on the ice. Mm-hmm. And everyone has a story. And one of the ladies, she's like, I just got out of church and I was crossing the parking lot and someone hit me. And she's like, I ended up hitting the car, but ended up skidding on one leg in like a ballet pose. And, and she's like, didn't even fall. And we all have stories like that of catching themselves, which um, are so worth the, the time, the money, the energy spent just to be able to save ourselves from a fall. No, it's, it's, it's massive. And then we do that as a demonstration too. We use, it's funny you said the, the ice thing we use, okay, you want to land on black ice on your heels or you want to land on black ice on your forefoot. It's really pretty easy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, I want to land my forefoot. Then why are you walking on your heels? And, and the other is that when you, we see, we've had, and there's one experience a woman talks about in the book, uh, Susan Stone, who's a famous journalist that people who fall, um, and have good balance, it's a series of sort of catch and releases to the ground. So when they hit the ground, there's no velocity. People who have bad balance will immediately stick out an arm and say, go ahead, break my arm to protect my, my vital organs or my head. So it's, uh, and it is, I've watched people fall and it is, this, it's a ballet. It's like this graceful set of movements where the body repositions and has balance for a second and then loses it and repositions and has balance all the way to the ground. So there's almost no velocity when they hit the ground at all. And it, and it looks like ballet. And you're, and you're right about the arm. I love that you said that because I try to explain to people when you get thrown off balance, your arms get out. They want to be involved in sort of counterbalancing things and legs will fly and all those things are meant to do that on purpose. And ballet has organized that in the beautiful movement, but it's all the natural movements you're in when you lose your balance. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's really, it's impressive. And growing up as a kid who was just really naturally uncoordinated, it's been very <laughs> rewarding to actually develop some level of coordination. I thought it was really interesting that you equate balance 
with coordination. Oh, absolutely, yeah. And we, fascinating. We can, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty confident we're developing a digitized form of measuring balance based on this, you know, Klopman balance index. And I didn't want to name it that somebody else did, but when I turned it into KBI, I felt more comfortable with it. But it's, you know, zero, you have no balance at all. 20, you a cane or a walker. And that's what we live in. You know, we live in these sidewalks and perfect steps with the, uh, for people with canes or walkers. 50 is average. 60 is a good athlete. 80 is like a good collegiate athlete. 90, 95 are the best athletes in the world. 100 is a Cirque du Soleil performer. But I think I could take, I've done it with skiers. I could take 10 NFL linemen and 10 F NFL receivers and just spend a few minutes balance training them. And I'll tell you which one's the best and which one's not. And it's a huge component to athletic performance. I studied um, the NFL combine one year and they have a drill called the five, five, 10 shuttle. And it's supposed to be a, a drill of agility. And I saw that the very best receiver got a $6 million contract, the next level down with a $1 million contracts. The different, and then all the ones with the $1 million contracts had about the same time in the shuttle drill. The $5 million receiver had a time that was only 4% better, something like that. And he got $5 million. And I believe that if you went through the whole fitness world and you saw that just by improving somebody's balance a little bit, thereby improving their coordination, that they'll make a tremendous amount of money. So I think unequivocally that if I see someone's balance, I'll tell you that that's the best athlete or the most coordinated athlete. Mm -hmm. So I want to get into the athletic part of it too, because uh, we share some interests there for sure. But mm. I want to kind of finish up on the longevity aspect that we're not necessarily talking about. There is a fountain of youth as far as uh, being more capable longer right know, not being bound to the wheelchair and so right forth. for the average person what would you say that doing some kind of balance training what would that mean to them well i think it you know and i'm not trying to pitch the book but you know it's all about one foot balance so it's not you know what's there's a couple of crazy things nowadays you see people go and you'll see them in the gym they're balancing on one foot and the other got the other leg kicked in front of them they got a locked out knee and they're back on their heel well nobody's ever in that if you're you got a leg kicked out you're on a heel with a locked out knee you're going to go down in in the world your balance position is your knee is bent you 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 know we try not to use latin words i don't even like to use the word glute so i'll say butt because which one of the eight glutes are we talking about but you know sticking your butt out a little bit your chest is up shoulders are back eyes are up and you just will balance on that one foot and you can do it on one towel always have something nearby to stabilize you do it barefoot do it on a piece of foam or a towel that's really important i think for older people who wear uh, a bifocals or progressives take them off you may not see well but you'll balance better without them because your peripheral vision does not need glasses so when you start cutting off vision with that and we feel like you know bifocals and, and uh, progressives actually will hurt people's balance over time so those are the types of things the other is to go get away from the screens get out of the house get away from the walls get away from the floors get away from the phone look at a tree the tree is a destabilizing thing in some sense because there's no perfectly vertical horizontal surfaces around it and start to engage that big vision. And you'll see just a huge balance just from doing simple things like that. And in terms of, you know, oh, I'm too old to, it's not the case. It's never been, the, we've never seen anybody who couldn't improve their balance. I mean, I, we got a guy that no idea how he's doing what he's doing, but his balance improves. So it, it can improve at any age, but it has to be this one foot thing and you have to be able to engage the whole body and keep your eyes open and all that kind of stuff. Well, I really appreciate that the book is, is very practical and easy to understand. Thank it's you. so easy when you get into these topics. And I really strive to do that with my book too, that um, it, it's important to make it really easy to read. Right. And I think a person, you know, there's plenty of testimonials of how there is really great um, cognitive, cognitive um, benefits, and also, but especially athletic improvements. And so that to me, there's no doubt that it would help the average person who's not necessarily trying to improve their golf score and, and so forth, that right. it just helps them to stay safer, more capable, and right. hopefully improve their, their brain capacity. Even like right. what Dr. Amon said to you, that, you know, you need to improve these aspects of your brain to right. even prevent any right. neurodegeneration. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. 
So then, so let's move on to our, our favorite subject, to <laughs> um, athletics. And so I was explaining before we started recording that uh, some of my primary training is uh, martial arts. I do yoga as well, ballet, and um, mountain biking in the summer. Although I think compared to Utah mo- actual mountain, I think it's more cross country. Right. And, and last year when I was riding, my husband, who's um, he's the motocrosser, he's the the right. speed guy, and so he. I'm really. Gr- it's really fun because I have a built in trainer, right. and he's like, I think you need to work on your balance some more because I always have felt that I'm on top of my bike. Like I don't mm-hmm. feel like I'm in my bike. Right. Right. Well, it's a, I, I gave you a story about a mountain bike. You know, I, um, Janet, who wrote the book, made my, my wife, she's um, a mountain biker here in Park City, but she rides a bike with only one gear. There's no gears. And she'll climb every mountain out here. And she's got, you know, a massive aerobic engine. I don't. And I don't even have the constant. I'll go out and ride with her. And I, I'm, I've played football, a six second sport or, you know, wrestled a two minute sport or skied, which is, I never did anything that was a long term sport. So for me, I fall too much, not because I can't stay up. It's because I can't stay focused like that for an hour long, you know, going through these really gnarly places. But she, um, she will tell you that her downhill speed has improved hugely once she got fully, you know, balanced in. And she says, I can't switch to a higher gear to pedal faster. She says, the only way I'm going down faster is downhill faster is because I have, my balance is so good. So it's a huge component, I think, to, to any sort of biking. And, and I think your husband's right. You'll be surprised at the improvements. But the other thing is that you learn when you balance train is we taught Janet how to use her eyes. She's using her eyes completely differently than she did before. When you, again, this is one of the secrets we discovered and I kept it locked up for years, but now I'm just like the heck with it. You have a massive amount of data that comes into your autonomic system that you don't even know about. And we have ways of demonstrating it and we teach people how to use it. That that's the information you need coming in. You can't be looking at the rock with your conscious vision and go, Oh, there's a rock. It doesn't do you any good. So and then Janet said too, which is a really good point. She said, if you don't think bicycling is a balance challenge, just think back to when you were a kid learning how to ride a bike. Mm-hmm. It's all balance. It's a massive amount of balance. And so I think even with road riders, when they learn how to, you know, keep their wheels steady and not roll their wheels from side to side because they have a balance issue, they actually will ride better too. I, there's, it, it affects every sport positively. The only one I don't understand is swimming, but I've had swimming coaches tell me it would help them, but I don't know how. So. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, that kind of throws a whole new perspective on it. <laughs> yeah, so, um, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, you know, one, th- one of the key points that we didn't hit in terms of sport is that, you know, we, and you don't see this, I don't, I haven't seen it yet. Of course, I don't get to see all the research, but it doesn't seem to be clearly stated as such. We see the balance system as an integral part of the autonomic nervous system. It's one of the, you know, your heartbeat. And you can slow your heart rate down. You can speed it up. Your blood flow, you can change your blood flow. You can change your breathing rate, all these things. You can't make your balance worse or better. You can't fake it and make it worse. And you can't consciously make it better. It's one of the most controlling systems you have. So when a receiver or a soccer player has to run down and cut hard to the left, he can only cut at the rate that his balance system allows him. It doesn't matter how great his, his muscles are, how great his skills are. Ultimately, his balance system says, I'm not going to let you go any further than that. In your martial arts, you're only going to be able to throw a kick or a punch to the limits of what your balance system allows. Because if you go over that balance system limit, what happens? You fall down. You don't want to do that. It's just amazing. As soon as you improve the balance system, it's like, oh, now I kick harder. Now I can punch harder. So it's, it's really the controller of all aspects of human movement. On top of that, what we were talking about before with the peripheral vision, once you, the best athletes, the Seth Currys, the Michael Jordans, the Wayne Gretzkys, the best fighters in martial arts also have this amazing vision. Now, why do the two go together? Why does coordination and vision go together? Because one really directly affects another. A really great martial artist can sit there and not really look at the other body, but see the whole other body and knows where every move is coming from. Almost like imperceptibly. Is not looking at a shoulder with their conscious vision, is not looking at the belly button of the conscious vision. They see this whole entity in space. And when a move comes and you see this with great boxers, they're just like, oh, here we go. 
I mean, it doesn't even look like they're, they're not even moving fast. Some guy's wheeling in with a big roundhouse right. He just steps aside and goes, boom, cracks him with the left and the guy's down. So the two go together. And uh, we think that with the riding the bike or anything you do in any sport, great vision comes with great balance and coordination. Yeah, definitely. Well, it made a lot of sense, too, when you were talking about the bifocals. And in right. dance, we're taught to you know, at least look level, if not up a little bit. Right. And it's absolutely amazing, also because your head is so heavy and right. as far as your alignment. And right. Oh, yeah, it's bad, yeah. So there's so many, there are a number of factors that when you can bring them together, especially. Right, right. I want to talk about shoes, too. So we're getting to the end, but we can't get shoes. So, you know, give us a bit of a spiel, and then what kind of shoes do you use and recommend? Well, listen, if if I'm, like, drowned in a river next week sometime, just check with the shoe companies. Anyways, every shoe company, every major manufacturer of Nike, Under Armour, all of them make running shoes that have a lift. So the heel is off the ground anywhere from four to ten uh, millimeters. It looks, it's a heel. It, it's hidden inside the rubber of the shoe. Secondarily, they all have turned up toes. So, I mean, I don't know why. It's thinking like, well, I run on the heel and I roll off on my toe. But when you're standing around, by the way, 90% of the time in athletic shoes is spent not running. Mm-hmm. It's spent living. So you're in these shoes it forces you to lock out your knees. And the most important part of your balance system in terms of your feet, your toes are off the ground. Take off those shoes and stand on the ground and tell me where your toes are. They're pinching the ground. That's where they belong. Your knees are slightly bent. So every shoe is debilitating to the balance system. And add to that that you're, you're totally inoculating any sensory information that comes from the ground because you have these thick, mushy shoes on. So, I mean, I... I uh, the shoes to wear, and this is a problem. They're, they're getting, there's some research that came out that said minimalist shoes were bad to run in. Yeah, they are bad to run in if you start running with a heel strike. And I'm not saying everybody, sh- you know, should run in them. I'm talking about living and moving day to day. So, I mean, for day-to-day shoes, I wear Toms. That's it. There's no sole, no structure to them at all. Uh, for athletic shoes, um, who was it? Um, New Balance made these shoes called minimalist shoes. And they just stopped making them. And they had like really like, I had three pair of minimalist shoes. I knew they, when they came out, they were going to stop me. I had four pair I bought at one time. Mm-hmm. They stopped making them four years ago. I still work with them. I put glue on the bottom. I try to cover them up. The only shoe company that's getting close, and, they, and he's a good friend of mine, Steve Sashin at Zero Shoes. They just made a shoe and a running shoe. I still think they got some things that they should change. You know, and I guess one day I'll sit down and talk to them about it. There is no shoe out there. I like Innovate used to have great little zero structure shoes. Vivo Foot has zero structure, but then they got other things that kind of get in the way, but nobody does it right. So it's frustrating to me. I'm going to start contacting some of the shoe companies and see if I can work with them. But other than bare feet and, you know, these Toms that, you know, zero structure. Mm-hmm. whole foot's on the ground and so when you when you learn how to walk on the forward part of your foot with your knees flex as a dynamic movement with your butt kind of turned out a little bit um you'll find you you can, i have beautiful italian loafers i've had for years with little tiny heels on them i can't wear them anymore because the heel clicks every time i come through mm-hmm. yeah it's 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 one of those things that, you know everybody's so specific too in what they want and what they need um and I found, I think, some of my best training and learning to pick up my foot was right. uh, it's going to third world countries and all the <laughs> sidewalks and, and stuff uh, and the, the roots that are coming up from, from everywhere. And really, you see the most capable people there as well in, in un- these undeveloped places. And so there, there are, yeah, like you said, you know, yes, we, we want to accommodate people who truly can't be mobile. Right. In, in these places, but it is, it's very interesting how we're um, not helping ourselves either. So, um, well, and there's, some, there's some great research that says from Ch- Japan, it says just walking on cobblestones mm-hmm. for elderly people barefoot improves their balance. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just, and so, you know, oh, we got reflexology and we massage the hell out of our foot and it makes everything better on us. Now go put on those crappy sneakers with one inch of rubber underneath you and let them never be activated again. I mean, it's just stupid. Reflexology is walking in third world countries like you're talking about. Yeah. 
or in yoga training, we also talked about uh, walking in the sand and yeah. how that really makes your, your muscle right. work and right. challenges the flexibility. Right. Right. You did end up creating a, a product. We will have to at least mention and end up here that actually helps a person train their balance. We, we have, well, first I invented the Slack bow, which is a slack line type of device, but we don't walk on it because there is no athletic position. We have one foot in front of the other. We do, and we put a plate on the line and we do a series of movement exercises on this line and we get 70 year old people up on it. So we have this whole, and we've got a protocol called the 12 minute routine that we filed a patent on, but you know, it's a big expensive piece of equipment. And then we developed something called the slack block, which is just a little tiny, you know, it looks like a piece of foam. You're like, Oh gee, that's a piece of foam, but it has a piece of wood on top of it, a plate on top of it, you know, with grit paper on it. And that plates got a patent applied for it's a different ball game altogether. You get, I mean, so many people go, I'll get on it and they'll get on it and they'll go, Oh, that's a lot harder than it looks. <laughs> and so you'll find, now I think you, it'll be interesting to see you and your husband. I'm going to send you one. We'll take a little video for you a first time around. You, you'll find the ballet dancer does remarkably good on that. So yeah. you'll see. That'll be fun. I'll see if I can get my ballet teacher to experiment with us. Too. Yeah, that too. Yeah. Now, do you recommend that a person use wear shoes when they're doing that or go barefoot? No, they, it's, that's an interesting question. We have people come in for the first time and they got their thick, you know, Under Armour shoes on with a little rubber underneath. They go, well, can I keep my shoes on? I'm going, okay. But I know within three or four minutes, they'll go, my foot hurts. Mm -hmm. And when you put somebody through a maximal balance challenge, the foot like is trying to grab and get, I want to be involved and the toes are moving and they're really working so hard that the foot starts to cramp because the foot's trying to go, I want, I need to be involved in this process and you're not letting me affect it at all through these, the thickness of these shoes. So they'll say to me, uh, my feet hurt. Oh, okay, take your shoes off. To take the shoes off, the feet stop hurting. Yeah, I think the most you can go barefoot. And by the way, we don't ever think you should use socks because they're just naturally too slippery. Um, there's some great sock companies out there now that are making unslippery socks, but it's just, we just say go bare, barefoot if you can. And uh, yeah, once you do the barefoot thing, and then you'll start to, shoes will change for you. Suddenly you're like, oh, I don't want my toes all crunched up. I, I like to be able to move my toes inside my shoes. And, and your whole vision of the world starts to, go through balance, I guess, to a certain extent. Definitely. So do you have like a little instruction booklet or, or videos the person can follow? Yeah, when you get the, when you get the uh, block, the, uh, the, the, the box is covered with disclaimers. Don't do this if you don't. <laughs> and then you open it up and there's a sheet of disclaimers. But on that sheet, there's a link to a, a series of videos that teach you how to use it. Okay, great. Well, I'm excited to try because I always, you know, every time I find something that can help performance, and again, I'm not, I'm actually not a competing athlete. I just really enjoy reaching new levels. Of right, and right. This is, you know, I'm actually, I'm 35 and I've got, I'm more coordinated, more healthy than I am, than when I was 18. Right, right. It's so rewarding. I want yeah. to continue. Well, it will, and you'll be surprised. And, you know, we've had, like I said, you know, it's funny you said you're uncoordinated. You, you, I can tell how people move, whether they're coordinated enough, just when they sit, and you're not uncoordinated. So, I mean, it's just I'm always watching these movement patterns and how people foot strike and how they move their shoulder and hold their head and all these things. And you can tell coordination and uncoordination just by looking at somebody. So you're, you're beyond your uncoordinated phase right now. I don't know where you're going to go to next, <laughs> beyond it. I have, I have reached that point. My joke is when we're training martial arts or when I'm trying to teach someone else something that I, I finally learned the difference between my left and my right. So <laughs> yeah, now I'm, really <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> yes. So um, it was great fun talking and, and exploring more about balance and how it can improve our health overall as an athlete or an, an everyday average person. Is there a message you would like people to just to like have in their brains at the end of this? Well, you know, there was a, you know, it's like, all right, so I'm, and I'm not helping feed the world and I'm not creating something that makes everybody's life easier. But this is a modern human being problem that we live in this world where our balance is not, people don't know anything about their balance. My balance is fine because it hasn't, I haven't fallen. But I go back to that quote in the book by Catherine Ann Gertz, who's an anthropologist who studies indigenous tribes that aren't exposed to modern man and ask them, you know, how do they utilize their senses, hearing, taste, seeing, all that kind of stuff. And um, she's interviewing the Anway Way people in, I think, Ghana. 
and she asked them, you know, which of these five senses, which of your five senses is most important? And, and they kept going, well, but you forgot the most important one. They said, she said, which one? They said, the balance system. And it's, you know, it's, it is a survival thing when you're in the wild. It's survival when you go to those third world countries and you got to walk over those rocks and roots and everything. You know, sprained ankle, if you're an indigenous tribe, could mean death because the tribe's not going to wait around for you. They're going to give you two days. You can't get it together. They'll leave you three days of food and, and that's it. You're done. So it's just a huge problem that people don't realize. And when I quote these numbers about people over 45 falling, I've met several of these people. They're healthy people. They're not, you know, overweight, uncoordinated people. They're healthy people. They just don't realize it. They don't realize how bad their balance has gotten. Yeah, it can, uh, uh, one fall can make a significant difference in, in a family. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So where can we find you and learn more about this? I mean, slackbow.com, S-L-A-C-K-B-O-W.com, or just Google Slackbow. We're the only ones with that goofy name online right now. Well, that makes an advantage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it does. Thank you so much for being on the Wait for Your yeah. podcast today. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you. You too. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Did you think of someone while you were listening to this podcast? I know I thought of so many people while I was reading Jim's book and learning more about this information. Go ahead and share this with your friends and family that you think it could benefit. You can share it on Twitter, Facebook, simply email or word of mouth. We really appreciate you sharing the wonderfulness of the Way for Wellness podcast with your friends and family. And if you're really finding a lot of benefit value from Weight Free Wellness Podcast. We really appreciate you leaving a review on iTunes or even on our Facebook page. It means the world to us. It lets us know that we're doing a good job and also helps people who are deciding among the many resources out there for health and wellness that this is one that's really worth their time. Again, thank you so much. And while you're at it, at wayfreewellness.com, we have all kinds of goodies there. We are continually creating health and wellness programs to help you and your family. And there are a number of them that are free, free classes online. Currently, our everything you need to know about sun health is up and available there for you to download for free. And if you're listening to this many months later, there'll probably be something else really good there available for you to download. So go to wayfreewellness.com, check out what's available, and we'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.